Good morning. Welcome to the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee and our hearing today as part of our inquiry on addictive and immersive technologies. I wondered if I could start the questioning. Uh, the first question really for uh, James and Matus. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, your experience with game quitters and how you got involved with that. So I got involved in Game Quitters in my second year of university. I came into university five years ago and immediately I started experiencing you know, loneliness and kind of, kind of feelings of isolation a little bit, I would say. And I turned to games as the way to cope with those feelings. And it got to a point where it was, it was affecting my life too much. I decided to do something about it. And I discovered Game Quitters on website Reddit and I I got involved immediately and I found the support group and that was about three years ago and I, I, I was a member of Game Quitters for about two years actively. And uh, similarly I found it in university as well in my second year um, because I was starting to fall behind in my work and my grades were slipping and eventually I ended up uh, dropping out of university as a result of playing too many, uh, many games and through that I kind of thought I need to stop somehow so I looked up online how to stop gaming and Game Quitters came up and instantly joined up and yeah. What's, what, sort of, um, what sort of games are you playing? Uh, myself I <coughs> prefer to play games which focus on kind of one character in a fantasy world um, where you <coughs> go out on these adventures and you kind of get immersed in this world and get lost and it's just a way of escaping I think for me Was, was there any particular um, for, 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 for me as well any particular games that uh, you played? For me it was League of Legends that was a big one I played Hearthstone which is a card game and most recently it was Overwatch which is a shooter game hmm. and they're all multiplayer so I played other people um, was that, was that um, was the fact that they were multiplayer, was that a big part of the attraction to the I, game? I think so, yes, because it was a sense of community, I could talk to other people, I could, I played with my friends a lot, and I think it was a big factor actually for me. And would you play with strangers as well? Or, or? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Is this similar for you, James? Uh, yeah, a bit of a mix. Um, I like the, the multiplayer community aspect of playing online games with people, but uh, eventually I just got kind of distant from a lot of my friends and focused on games like uh, Dark Souls, um, Skyrim, uh, these massively open RPG uh, games. And how, how, what sort of, at, at the sort of greatest extent of your, of your game playing, what, how many hours are, in, in, a, in a session would you play? Um, for me, it could range from anywhere from four hours up until the most I ever played was 32 hours straight uh, in university, first year. I didn't eat or sleep or anything, didn't leave my room, just 32 hours on the Dark Souls. For me, it would be anywhere from four to maybe 12 the most. I, I think 12 was like the biggest kind of streak I played. And what was the what was the trigger for you both in recognizing that this this was becoming harmful and something that you wanted to do something about? Uh, for me, it was dropping out of university. I was studying physics and suffered from quite bad depression as well as a result of that. And everything just started uh, cascading down and down as a result of um, me escaping my problems through gaming and. Got to a point where I just thought, yeah. yeah. And for me, it was a breakup with a girlfriend, which we had a kind of bad relationship because of me playing games and spending a lot of time on my computer. And I think that was the wake up call that when she said, like, yeah, I wasn't spending much time with her, and you know, she break up with, broke up with me. Yeah. And where did you first turn for help? Um, I think the first place was the Game Quitters Forum. Mm. Um, there's a challenge to quit gaming for 90 days and you make a journal every single day with this on this forum and interact with other people of the community, you chat all the time and it's a great place to kind of keep yourself accountable mm. and 
get to know other people mm -hmm. on the journey with you? I started by reading books about you know habits, about addiction, about all these things, but eventually I got to Game Quitters, which was the, 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 the best solution, the best kind of help I could get. Yeah. And what, what, what advice would you give to other people that may, may have been, may currently be going through the sort of experience you went through and, and don't know how they, how they can uh, break the cycle of behavior? Hmm. Uh, yeah, oh, so I guess the community is a big part and if you have people who are in the same boat as you, who, who know what you're going through, who you can talk to, who can support you when you have a difficult period in your life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to, to find a support group and you know, join Game Quitters because that's I think the biggest support group there is for now. And just don't be afraid of talking about the, the, the addiction or the problems you, the person faces. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, for, I, the final couple of questions for me, from the people you've engaged with through Game Quitters, I mean, how do, do, do you feel the experience you went through it, it was not, it's not unique, there are other people that have gone through something very similar? No, oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I know a lot of people have completely changed their lives, um, myself included, through Game Quitters. Um, people have started businesses, travelled the world and really made something of themselves rather than just playing games for eight hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> and, Jack, if I could ask you, I mean, based on your experience, people you interact with uh, online, is I mean, do you do you feel what James and Mason talked about is a is a is a real problem uh, that we, that we need to talk more about? Um, I mean, my side of the internet is, isn't really gaming and yeah. stuff, so it's yeah. more it's more about um, accessibility to higher education mm. uh, and that that side of things. So for me, I've had a really positive experience with social media and. Yeah. Um, I definitely, in terms of addiction, I definitely think that, um, although I wouldn't necessarily recognise it as an addiction in the traditional sense, where I, when I wake up I do check it straight away, it's the first thing I do. Um, and it will be, I, when I'm at university I come out of a lecture and the first thing I do is like open my phone and check mm -hmm. social media. So I suppose, you know, I, those are essentially addictive tendencies. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think maybe the vocabulary that we have to talk about social media doesn't think of it in that particular way because it's so accessible it's in your pocket all the time yeah um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great <laughs> probably members of the committee can relate to that well. yeah. uh, Julian Nudge yeah thank you chair uh, and James and Mason thank you very much for coming in by the way and already talking so honestly about things um, just to, just to test, how did you start start out in terms of gaming were you you were very young weren't you what, what sort of ages were you uh, for me it was about Three or four. Three or four. Um, it was that old consoles that my dad yeah. had, like the really old. Like Mega Drives and Snedges yeah, and that Yeah, Mega Drive, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah I could have been five or six. Five or oh, six. so my dad had a computer, I just played on the computer. Yeah. So th those types of, those first experiences are quite isolated, aren't they? Because it's like a Mega Drive and a Snes is nothing that doesn't have anything to do with the internet. You know, you're just playing a game. But what time did you start sort of branching out and starting the online gaming? Well, how old were you then? For me, it was very early. We had computers in school, and we had the class where you went to computers, and we played the game maybe once per week. And, you know, I was maybe six or seven, I would play with my friends mm -hmm. every week. And it was, yeah, we'd play online, we'd play together, and it was a way to kind of spend time. So very early, I think. Yeah. James? Well, it was um, probably during school. Yeah. Uh, I think when Call of Duty became popular, Right. It was, uh, I can remember the exact day that we bought our first wireless router as well. Like getting the internet set up in the house. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and from there, it just kind of took off with every every one I knew in school played Call, Call of Duty, Duty or some of the Xbox or PlayStation game. When it was, uh, it was the Xbox 360. Yeah. The kind so of, the generation before this one. Yeah, it kind of accelerated everything. So that's the yeah. playground chat though. Yeah. yeah, but you were still you were presumably very young then. You're talking about yeah, you're, you're about nine, ten, that sort of age. Oh uh, no, after that, um, probably about fourteen. Right, 15, okay. It started, I think. Okay, um, but you got this interaction online. What did being part of this community do for you? Do you think? Because obviously you you're, you're playing with other players. Call of Duty is very much an interactive game. That's the whole point of it, really, isn't it? it what what did it actually do for you, at James and Matt Um probably degraded my social skills yeah. <laughs> quite a lot. Um, we were having but social interaction with people though, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, but it was a different kind of social interaction. Mm. Um, 
and it was still just the same people you'd talk to at school. You'd spend seven hours at school with someone and then go home and spend another five hours playing video games with them every single day. The same people, you and your yeah. school friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And is that true for you, mate? Yeah, it was well? it was a way to belong because all the guys in my in my class we all played the same games usually and we just talked about them for hours when we were yeah. in school and, and our breaks we just talk about the game we played last night or the day before and it was we all played them so we, we all could talk about it yeah this could be seen almost as a replacement for sport to a certain yeah. extent mm -hmm. yeah. which is what you so were playing you know you play your, your football or whatever mm -hmm. after school in that regard so these these would, would seem to me like they were quite closed groups is that would that be fair enough or would people come in from outside in your experience I think in the school console community on Xboxes mm. and whatnot, it's quite closed. And then um, I know a lot of people branched out into PC gaming, yeah. which is a lot more playing with random people online, meeting other people, talking to them. Yeah. Um, so I think with the, um, in schools, it was very much a close mm. uh, community. Does you, when you do that, which you've done, you've you branched out effectively mm -hmm. later on, does your experience change and how does it change in terms of your own your own mental experience in terms of your you know the sort of the, the people who come at you a little bit differently because these mm. people you're playing with before are friends or school friends and that sort of thing but then suddenly you're into a different world out there yeah. what's just, just give me some, some idea of that sort of experience um, I'm sure most people can relate to how you've got loads of friends in school and then at university you have less friends and after that less they kind of narrow down. You've got even less people you talk to and meet um, at university, and uh, cause this, which was when I got into PC gaming. And so I started spending time online only with a couple of people, and then those people went as well. So I was forced to kind of <clears throat> go on my own and... Um, Go you to do, different groups. Yeah, yeah. Meet other people through these groups online. And how did that feel? Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So for me personally, playing with people online, with random people, it was always very stressful because I know when we play with my friends, we play League of Legends, which is a five player versus five players. Yeah. And we would joke around with someone would do something stupid, we just laugh at it. But if you play with random people and you do something poorly, they will just abuse you verbally right. and it's 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 a lot of abuse and I think I had to stop playing League of Legends because of this I was very competitive in the game and I just couldn't take the stress of every game like after every game my, my heart rate would be elevated I would be very stressed I would be shaking after each game because of the things people say to you you know you, you could let's say you, you die in the game and people would just tell you to kill yourself because you're so terrible at the game and this was a very common occurrence this was almost every game Whereas with their friends, like if my friend gets angry, I can I can, I can deal with that. It's 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 a friend. We we laugh at it. But a if it's a, if it's a stranger yeah. and it's every game you play, it gets very stressful. Yeah. yeah. And what about? I mean, that that's absolutely fascinating in, in terms of that. And that that you know, that's what I was getting at. In terms of that sort of slightly different world that you exist with when you do branch out beyond where your friends are, because you've got a context with friends, haven't you? You know mm -hmm. them. You know the face. You know the the turn of phrase, if you like. Whereas someone in that world is totally different. Um, in terms of the people who are in that world, who are interacting with you, were there a lot of people you felt were, 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 were adults? Were there a lot of people that, was it the sim same age groups, do you think? Or were the people maybe posing as other people, that sort of thing? What was your experience? Um, it depends on the game you play, um, but League of Legends as well, so I played that a lot. Mm. Um, it was mostly probably young adult, late teen, um, maybe mid twenties, but then if you go to a game like Counter Strike, it's probably an older audience. Still exactly the same toxic behaviour, telling yeah. you to kill yourself every game. It was, um, yeah. It just depends on which game you're playing mm. on which console. I think. Mm. I think it's a bit hard to tell as well because mm. you only get some kind of response, <coughs> some kind of typed response, and there's. It's hard to tell like how old the person behind yeah. really is, but it could be anything between fifteen and you know thirty usually. But yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. I think yeah. does that unsettle you, not being able to know precisely how old these people are? No, no, not yeah. really. Because you're only with them for about 20, 30 minutes yeah. at the most, and it's kind of you move on, and then yeah. 
don't really think about them. You get someone else to replace them. <laughs> and how, how do you think that the fact that you were interacting in this way, in this open world environment, effectively online, with all these people on that side, how do you think that led to you shutting down in terms of your immediate, your immediate circle of people around you, at university or family? How did that sort of... Where do you think that, that led to... Because obviously you're, you're being very open in terms of this online gaming stuff. And then what happens? You sort of then slink, slink away from everything else. Mm. How, how does that work? Um, um, yeah, I think like the more personally, the more comfortable I got online, and I was very comfortable. I was I was very good at the games I, w- I would play, but then I would go outside for a lecture, and I wouldn't know how to interact with my friends, with people around me, and it's 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 a, it's a feedback loop. Like you go. You go online, you're, you're doing well, you feel good, and then you go outside, it's stressful, you don't know how to relate to people, so you go back, you play a bit more, you feel happy. It's, it's, it's self-perpetuating in that way, but I think it may be much less kind of open to, to people in the real world. I, I, I think it made, me, it made it more difficult to talk to people outside of games, because it, mm-hmm. there wasn't this kind of whole context of games which I was really good at, which I kind of knew how to talk about, how to navigate this world. I didn't really know how to navigate, you know, small talk or kind of real life discussions. Yeah, and James. Um, so for me, again, university was the big kind of catalyst for it, because you no longer have um, parents telling you to go to bed and do work and whatnot. And so I had this all this free time um, for me to just sit in my room in the dark and play games until three in the morning. I don't think in my first year I completed a piece of coursework before two in the morning. Mm. the day before it was due, yeah. because of I was playing video games all evening. Mm. And uh, eventually this just starts to have an effect on your physical health, your mental health, you stop, because um, things don't give you as much um, joy as video games, kind of fires up all the, the response systems in your brain, mm. and things just don't feel as good, don't make you as happy, so you start <clears throat> falling into this pattern of uh, why would I go and spend time with friends when I can just go and play games and uh, you start becoming quite isolated and lonely as a result of that. You've both mentioned happiness a couple of times actually in terms of relationship to video games and yet you've also mentioned the fact that you know you've been online and told to kill yourself, you've been really badly online and how you come up basically sort of shaking and nervous like almost like oh, you've got too much caffeine in your system you know. How's that happiness? It's not. <laughs> it's, you know, I don't think I've there haven't been many times where I've actually been truly happy playing video games, but I kept playing them because it felt good to complete these objectives and get these trophies and these points and beat people. And um, it's always been quite competitive, so it kind of mm. fueled that as well. But yeah, I've never really been happy playing games. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you get some sort of rewards because a lot of those games are based on lots of giving you lots of rewards. So let's say you get a new character, you get a better rating, you get this new piece of armor, and those those things feel good in some sort of primal level, like getting new shiny things, and it, it felt good. But then the actual experiences that would come out of the game, and if I and if everything else outside would feel kind of bland in comparison, like. I would sit in a lecture and I'd be like, not shaking, but I would be, I would feel like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of missing something. And I would go back home, I would play some game and it would come back. I would feel kind of, not happy, but normal in a way. Like that was the normal level. And the real world was kind of below that level. It was not, I wouldn't feel as happy in the real world, but I would feel happy or more normal in the in the virtual world, even though I wasn't mm. very happy. It's, it's come, it's a weird feeling. It's, it wasn't happiness, but it was kind of what I knew, and it was kind of normal. Yeah. One final question, Jeff. Uh, James, you mentioned before about a sort of depressive episode at, at university, which said lots of young people experience that at university, and you know, any time you go away from your, your family, your home, and that sort of thing. Do you think it's possible you would you may have suffered that even if you hadn't been a gamer, or do you intrinsically or potentially do you think gaming perhaps was the root, the absolute root cause of it, or do you think it's it was sort of a, a, a symptom potentially of a deeper malaise? Um, this is something I've asked myself a lot, <laughs> yeah. looking back on it, and I think it's almost impossible to tell exactly um, what effect it had. 
But what it did allow me to do was to kind of escape from my problems that were self-caused, for example, not doing my coursework or essays or exams and whatnot. And uh, it kind of gave me an escape to feel that things were actually okay and uh, that I wouldn't have to solve these problems in the, in the moment. I could put them off to another day. Yeah. And gaming was a way, kind of allowed me to, um, to do that. Whether it was the cause of it, I'm not sure, but um, obviously through Game Quitters you kind of encourage to quit gaming. And uh, the times when I did quit gaming, I was productive, I was happy, I was going out and doing new things, I was having these great experiences and meeting friends. And, and then as soon as I go back to gaming, I become this bitter, depressed, lonely, kind of just sad individual that. So I don't know if it's direct correlation or whether it's just a case of me letting my discipline slack and things kind of um, like domino effect and it leads to me playing video games. Mm. Self-perpetuating, yeah. that sort of thing. Now, does that ring true for you? It's 100% true, yeah. The exact same thing happened to me, exactly. But I will, I will say I think at first gaming is not a problem as much, but it becomes a problem because you're not taking care of things and those things become problems later on. So I think it is a part of the problem, not the, the, the root of it, but a big part of the problem because it creates new stressful situations in real life. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, go on to Rebecca and then. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. And uh, can I just ask, are you finding it difficult to talk about these things and to reveal to us what I am discovering quite shocking revelations? James? Uh, not really, not anymore. Um, I haven't played a game in about six months now and I pretty much just want this to become more mainstream. I want people to know about the problems that affect so many people and the more I can talk about that, the more we can talk about that and discuss these issues, the more comfortable I feel, I think, talking about it. Good, so. thank you. And uh, do you ever look back and think you've missed out on your childhood. <laughs> James first, then Mattis. Yeah. Um, As a mum with three children, I'm listening to this, and I'm, <laughs> I'm very sad. I, I battled with you know, one child who is, could have had those tendencies, but we managed to <laughs> hold fire. Yeah. What would you say? You know, what do you think that you might have missed? Well, I had a great childhood, so I was always active and a big part of the Scouts and all these different things, I was always playing sports and but where I really missed out was towards college, like 15, 16 onwards, where I started really getting into it. It affected so many of my relationships, um, especially like girlfriends at the time. Um, I started losing contact with my friends and I'm no longer in contact with them just because I cut myself away from them. And it's probably the friendships and the social experiences that I've missed out on which really caused me to um, I didn't really develop them in the way that I should have done in those years that are so critical to mm -hmm. kind of finding yourself as a person, I think. Matters is your experience similar? Well, for me, I always managed to kind of keep my social life <coughs> alive. I was never really playing... I was always playing with my friends and I would always like keep in touch with my friends. And I would always, you know, I would play sports, I would, you know, read books, I would do my coursework. So it was never that bad for me. But I, I, I wonder like what would happen like what could have been if I didn't play games because it took it just a lot of hours spent in some, what, something which is not really giving you anything in the end except you know maybe good feelings for half an hour so I wonder what would be if, if I didn't play games but I don't think I, I always kept my life like at okay level it wasn't oh, it wasn't ever terrible it was never that I had no friends or anything like that. Did, did your parents I'm just wondering, did your parents try to step in to reduce the hours you were spending gaming, or even your teachers at school? Do you think you it could have been different, and how could it be controlled? It was the issue is it was so normal to playing what thirty two hours. No, that was in university. That's when I just crumbled <laughs> basically. <laughs> but during school, like going home playing games for a few hours with your friends. Um, 
everyone was doing it, all my friends were doing it, and my parents, I don't think they saw a problem with it. Um, I've spoken to them since, and I think they do regret not putting a hard limit on, on the games. But nothing from teachers, just because we didn't see it as a problem, and we didn't talk to people about it, I don't think. So did you think you had a secret life then that people didn't know about? Or do you just think it was accepted uh, and it was okay? Yeah, because it was always all my best friends at school. And we'd just go and talk again. Um, none of us had, like, um, we were all quite popular at school. We all played sports together and um, engaged in social activities a lot. But it was, I wouldn't say it was a secret life, but it was probably secret to the uh, parents and our teachers, they didn't really realise how much we played these games, I don't think. Matt yeah. is the same? Yes, yeah, similarly, my parents never kind of forced me to just turn on the computer or anything, but I don't think they... Well, I, they knew like, I was spending a lot of time on it, but they, they never tried like, kind of putting me off of it um, in any way, so... Um, I, think, I think they knew I played a lot, but I don't think they... As long as it wasn't affecting my grades or anything, which it wasn't, I think they were okay with it. Do you think in retrospect, looking back now, that there should be some kind of limits set that parents should be aware of? Yes, 100%, yes. What sort of, what would you say or how do you think you could do it? I, th I think it's individual, but I think maybe, I think it's good to talk to, you, to the children and see how, how they see it. And I, I wouldn't say, I think at, at most, three hours, I think that's the kind of the scientific kind of limit as well, or if you play more than three hours, I think that's when it starts affecting you, but yeah, I think three hours is, is a good time per day, that's, that might be a bit too too high actually. So Well, three hours a day would be 21 I, I, I hours a week, which would be almost a solid yeah. day and night of gaming. So that might be even too much, yes. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I just ask you, we had in front of this committee at the beginning, um, someone who was chairman of BAFTA's Games Committee and CEO of URIC, which is the trade body for the UK games and interactive entertainment industry. And they were suggesting that gaming is not addictive. <laughs> what would you say to that? It's just not true. Yeah. So just ex expand a bit. Well, I think gaming by, by its nature has these kind of elements of it which are addictive by default. It, the, different games have different systems, but I think all of the games give you a lot of different rewards and a lot of, a lot of goals you can progress towards and lots of rewards for achieving those goals. And I think that at some level in your brain, that's, that's just very, very rewarding. And I think that's, it's, it's, it's too rewarding. I think it's, it's, it's addictive by, by default. And again, some games are better at this and some games don't try to, to do this at, at a larger scale, but I think all games, just by their nature, they try to make you feel good about you know, yourself or your character <laughs> or your accomplishments with other, other players, and I, th I think it's addictive just by default. And then some games, modern games specifically, they tend to create additional kind of layers of rewards and progression on top of the actual game, and I think that's where the trouble really begins, because then you have you have rewards just for logging in that day, you have rewards for completing a game, and it gets the ball rolling, and it gets the people really just spending time when they don't want to, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. The game League of Legends has the system where if you win a game that day, you get some extra points for to buy a new, ch new, new character. And there were days when I came home from my practice, and I would be at 11 in the night, and I, I didn't want to play a game, I wanted to go to bed. But I was like, oh, there's this reward. If I play just one game and if I win it, I get these extra points. And I would lose that game. But like, I really need those points now. I play another game. And sometimes it would be like three or four games until I finally won. And it would be two in the morning. And I'd be sitting there like, I didn't want to do this. I, was, I, was, I think I was tricked. So, so you were addicted? addicted? I, I would say so, yes. I would say so. James, yeah. were you addicted? Do you I think the games are addictive? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, it came about when I decided to quit gaming about a few weeks, 30, 40 days maybe. I don't know if you experienced as well, all these withdrawal symptoms <laughs> of being really? away from gaming. Yeah. Like what? Um, uh, headaches, moods. I physically had to shut myself out of the house, put my computer in the, the wardrobe, I lock it away. I had, uh, <laughs> deleted all my games, my passwords, gave my friends passwords just because I couldn't keep myself away from 
playing this game and I had so many urges. <laughs> I had urges every single day yeah. at a point. I think it was about 70 days into the 90 day initial challenge was when it really became bad for me and I couldn't stay in my house all day. The fear that I'd just go back on my computer and play. And then eventually after the 90 days I thought, hang on, it's, I don't need to play these games. Why was I so addicted to them? God, but my final question, Mr. Chairman, is we, we, uh, some of the people in the industry, because this is a booming creative industry in this country, and are trying to attract more and more people to go work in it, which obviously generates a lot for our economy. Do you think that industry is taking advantage of your childhood? I think to a point, yeah. Um, I mean, as someone who used to want to get into the game industry, um, uh, I think it can be kind of beneficial at some points to have video games and um, because obviously addiction affects people differently but I think more and more with modern games with this new every single game now seems to follow this what's called a free to play model whereas in the past you'd buy a game £20 and you'd get everything now you don't pay anything you just download it and the only way you can progress is by buying loot boxes and DL, uh, download, downloadable content or DLC to buy new characters and maps and it doesn't seem like much but eventually you start paying dozens and dozens more pounds than you would have done if you just bought the game and every single game now seems to be preying on this um, this model that's really quite addictive like the Fortnite Battle Pass it's called, I don't know if you know about it you pay a certain amount every month and you get extra bonuses, rewards, quests in the game. And it's, I remember, I think last year I decided to play Fortnite on a one-off with some friends. And they started um, shaming me for not having the battle pass, for not paying this £8 a month or something, because I had, I didn't, my character didn't look as good as theirs. Uh, it, it was just the default, this default skin kind of thing. And they had all these special equipment and props and it was literally just cosmetic <laughs> it played absolutely no part in being better at the game and they were still one of them just didn't want me on his team it got to that bad because I didn't have a said my character didn't look the right way and you see it with kids all the time um, I, I think I read about a young kid probably young teens stole their parents credit card so they could buy this re-release or limited edition <coughs> character for hundreds or thousands of pounds because they wanted to look and it's just I don't know how you can look at that and think that they're not trying to take advantage of this system that's in place that's become quite normalised now it's ridiculous <laughs> to me but yeah. thank you I thank you for the honesty with which you're addressing these things and just to, just to say to Jack as well we do have we do have some questions for you as well but, uh, <laughs> I think we'll probably stay with the game a bit for a bit longer and then we have to go to some questions on the social oh, no, media with you as well <laughs> uh, do you have a quick one Simon just, quick one. Yeah. Um, just follow up from Rebecca's reference to the gaming people we had in a, a, a few weeks ago and they were quite dismissive about the, 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 the addictive um, tendencies of their, what they were saying. And they, but whether, if they made any concession at all, it was to say, but don't worry, because there's a whole load of parental guidance stuff which comes with the, um, uh, it's tucked away somewhere in the, uh, in the game. So uh, you need, no need to worry because parents will always be able to you know, restrict and, and influence the way um, kids are getting engaged. I'm, I don't know what other committee members think about that, but is that a convincing argument in your view? I guarantee that most young people playing video games know more about their computers than their parents do. Yeah. And yeah. Probably, <laughs> and can probably get around whatever controls are in place quite easily, yeah. um, unless it's kind of password um, encoded or something. Even then, they've probably got a notebook with their passwords in in a drawer or something their parents might do. Or on their phone, and it's really easy to just get their parents um, go into their parents' phone. It might be their date of birth, their passcode, or something, or their PIN number, whatever. But it's really easy to get around these things, and it's there's just not enough in place. <laughs> okay. I can just add. I think a lot of us. I think James and for me as well. The problem, the trouble began when we left the homes and we actually went to university, and when all these parental controls were yeah. off for the first time. 
because and the, the systems in those games are still there. Like you can, now you have a credit card, you can pay for them, at least I did. And I wasn't prepared for that, I think. And like, I, was, I was spending all the time and money on these games and my parents weren't there. And maybe it's just my fault, maybe it's just like me who you know, fell into this trap. But I think the parental guidance, when it's, when it's there and it's not enough, but when it's not there, then you can really pay a lot of money for what's cosmetic items and like sparkly characters. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brendan and then Giles. And, and thank you again for, for your, your honesty here. It's, it's really quite enlightening. Um, can I ask, I want to stay on, on, on the addictive part of this. Was there a moment when you first considered yourself an addict? For me personally, I always kind of knew that this is something I have a problem with since I was maybe 15. I knew I was spending a lot of time on games, but I never thought like it's, it's terrible because I, had, I always free time. I had no way to fill the time, so I just want to play games with my friends. And I think I really saw myself as addicted is when I went to, went to university and then there was like no control. Like my friends were all back home and I just had all this free time. Like didn't do anything else just to play games. So I think 18, 19, around that age. I don't think there was any time I really thought I was addicted. Because I, I had quite a normal life at university, like good friends and girlfriend and whatnot. It wasn't until I um, found out about the symptoms of addiction through game critters, and I started thinking, oh, hang on, these are all, these, this is all me. I, I do every single one of these. Um, and it wasn't until I realised what addiction actually was I realised that I was. Okay, so, so, so <clears throat> you almost you went to game quitters to find out that you were addicted. So, so what what took you to to game quitters if you didn't think that you were addicted to it? Well, I just thought I played too much. <laughs> I didn't think I was addicted. Because um, I think there's um, quite a big difference between just playing games quite a lot and actually being reliant on these games for release and escapism and happiness and I think it's at that point when you make that connection is when you start to seek out the right help that you need and until then it's just a, a hobby really. So, so that there wasn't a specific moment or a specific event in your life that led you to think I need to pick up the phone to game quitters or whoever well, for me, I, I was trying to get help, but the real kind of kick for me was when, I, when my girlfriend broke up with me. Then I knew that actually this is the first event in which like, my compulsive gaming led to something which made my life a lot worse in that moment. And I think that realization kind of led me to really seek for help very, kind of, with much force, with much more force. Before then, I, I knew it was a problem, but it, wasn't, it, never, it was never causing any lasting harm, but this was the first event that was actually harming me in some way. And, and Matthias, did, did you think that you were addicted before you went to Game Critters? I, th I, think, I think so. I, I didn't think about it in those terms, but once I, again, once I like, saw the symptoms, I knew that this is something that I, I was. And I think it's a big part of it is something maybe denial, because you, you know you have a problem, but you're not kind of willing to admit to yourself that you have a problem. And I think addiction is this term which, once you, once you, once you use this term, it's, it's a very kind of definitive statement, like I'm an addict, I'm addicted. So I think I was avoiding kind of labeling myself in that way so I could kind of escape from solving the problem in a way. So I think I was, I think I knew I was addicted, but I, I, don't, I wouldn't use the term because it was a very strong term. And, and how did you both find out about game quitters? I just googled how to stop games, <laughs> basically. Um, I just thought one day I need to, to stop and I, how to stop gaming came across Game Critters and the forum and that's pretty much it for me. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the same as Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask you and please, you, 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 you don't have to answer this, but I just I want you to... Did, did you have, or, or did you think you have, 
do you think you have a particular personality trait that may make you susceptible to becoming addicted to gaming or do you think that what happened to you could happen to, to anyone else? And again, you don't have to answer that, yeah. it's quite a personal question. No, for me, it's, um, it's always been a lack of discipline, I think. Um, I never, I've, I've always procrastinated with schoolwork and coursework in university because it always worked and I got really good grades, so why wouldn't I <laughs> leave it to the end? And I never really um, got over that. Um, and so when it comes to, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to word it, because you start, once you start uh, slipping in one aspect, say for example I'd be going to the gym every day or something, once you stop doing that it becomes harder and harder to get back on track. And so I think for me the discipline aspect was why I kept coming back to gaming because it was easy and I was good at it. I had a friend who played a lot of games at university, um, he's one of my best friends now, but he was so hard working, he got everything done, he only played games after he'd finished his work, um, which kind of goes back to what um, Rebecca was saying about what we can put in place, saying I think video games should be a reward system after you've done these things, because throughout school I was come home from school, I'd play games, have dinner, play games, go to bed. I wasn't, I didn't have to do my work basically. And whether that's my fault or my parents or whatever is um, kind of in the past, but it's from that lack of discipline that everything else, the gaming is like at its core, these addictive tendencies, that's really what preys on my personality I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your, your honesty. For me, like I was playing since I was five or six years old, and I would play a lot of hours every every day. So I think over time it kind of became tangled up in my kind of self identity. I thought of myself as someone who just plays games, is good at them. And when I was maybe seventeen, eighteen, I thought I wanted to be a professional gamer because I was I was very good at the games. And I, yeah, I was just putting a lot of time. But I didn't think of it as a problem because it was something. I saw kind of meaning in, and I, I was I was good at, and I thought this is kind of like a legitimate path for me, but uh, yeah, I, I just had it was a big part of my identity, and it, that's what made it hard to kind of stop because I didn't want to kind of lose all of this kind of effort that I put put in gaming over the years. I would spend a lot of all of hours, and I didn't want to just throw all of this away, so I kept going past the time where it was good for me. I, I knew it was not good for me, but I kept going because I didn't want to kind of like lose all of this, I, all of this stuff I've built over the years. But you, you, the, the, the void that has been left with your addiction to, or your kicking of your, your addiction to gaming, I mean, has it been replaced by, I, I don't know, are you an obsessive stamp collector now? <laughs> you know, what, 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 what has replaced that, if anything? For me, it was the. Um, I, don't know, I kind of borrowed the idea of leveling up in video games, so why not take that and level up in life instead? And so I've kind of gone through this self development process over the last few years and replaced video gaming with all sorts of things from going to the gym. Um, I've been a musician for ages, and video <coughs> games kind of took that away. I'm a photographer, web designer, writer, I do loads of things now. And I just kind of filled it with as much productive stuff as possible. And it fills the same kind of drive of um, I'm seeing myself develop into this person mm -hmm. that can do all these amazing things and see all these amazing places and explore the world outside of the screen. So you haven't replaced it with one thing, you've replaced it with a whole range of yeah, different Yeah, pretty activities. much, yeah. yeah. For me, um, I think the biggest kind of replacement for me is programming and software development because it's it's similar. Use I think use similar skills. And I initially I wanted to kind of make my own games because I thought I can if I if I can be good at playing them I can try making them. And eventually, like you know, I became kind of a like software developer. So that's that's something I do as a as a replacement for games. But I also have different systems. Like my, I spend a lot of time with a girlfriend because she she knows this is a, this was a problem for me in the past. She kind of keeps me accountable. 
and if I say okay, let's maybe I, I can play a game today, she she will she will put me back to the right track. I also go to the gym. I read lots of books. I you know I, I do my coursework. I hang out with my friends. But the primary kind of reason I play games for me that was that was the the goals and achieving those goals. I think I can replace those with you know programming and any other activity which kind of has some kind of goals you, I can progress towards and get better at. It's because I can get better at. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you so much for being so honest and being so open. It must be very, must be quite a challenge. And it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Charles Watling. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, 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 I'm very interested in your evidence, and thank you uh, again. I reiterate what others have said. It's it's amazing you can be so honest about such an extraordinary thing, um, and I kind of understand to a certain extent. Um, but I'd, I'd like to ask you: Do you think it's 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 kind of a displacement activity that you get involved in when you're playing a game, in as much as the rest of life kind of piles up? You know, you've got essays you haven't done, stuff like that then you go into the game and you now have control of that environment. The rest of life is chaos, but that's an environment you can control. Is that kind of the mental space you go into there? There's, cause there's absolutely no consequences in a video game. Like You can lose all your progress, and that has happened to me, and there were tears <laughs> in the past because I was so into it. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't lose anything at all if you fail, and so you can just do whatever you want and you've got complete control to turn your character into this like incredible powerful whatever it might be yeah and <coughs> it doesn't affect anything outside of the world while everything piles up and kind of the more you stay in that world the less the rest of it matters isn't yeah. that, is, is that it Matrix is exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I've spent the last eighteen months or so quite involved with various uh, aspects of military training and stuff with, with the guys um, who are in, in, in our front lines all over the world, and um, a lot of their training does involve using this kind of technology. Now, clearly, there are positive sides to this. Now, what, what would you say is the positive? We've heard a lot about the downside, a lot about the addiction, a lot about your abrogating responsibility for other things and playing the game. What about the positive side? Where's the upside here? Um, a lot of people do genuinely find um, a lot of happiness and a great sense of community and social skills and whatnot through playing video games. And they're also being applied to all sorts of um, uh, things about dis uh, disabilities, um, with restrictive movements and whatnot. Right. And there's so many good things you can do with the technology and I think it's only a small subset of people that do suffer these addictive tendencies um, but in terms of actual positives from well there's not too many positives from playing eight hours of video games a day <laughs> but there might be some positives from playing one or two hours every other day or something every few days would you say the, the, the development of these games then is, is on the whole a good thing that, that is helping society or, or otherwise? How would you... it ha I don't know. It helps certain people and it hinders others. Um, I think in terms of pure technological advancements as a society, I think they're great. Um, pushing boundaries of what's possible with computing and graphical design and hardware and software. Um, but the way that these games are going, purely with this addictive nature in mind, I don't think it's the right way necessarily to be going about making these video games. Um, but I, it doesn't bother me if people play games or whether they create them. It's just as long as they're done with the proper um, restrictions, support and ideologies in place. Do, do you think when you were growing up, perhaps not enough emphasis was put on getting outside there, going sailing or? Walking in the woods and stuff no, like that. Not for me. No, I spent well, loads of time outdoors. You did. So, yeah, so, so, loads, so that, that um, was there and available for you. Yeah. And yet you just preferred to go into this gaming world as yeah. you got older. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I think for me it wasn't available. I, I think I played games because all my friends lived far away from me. So, if I wanted to, it wasn't very possible to meet up with my friends outside of school because we would all go home to these different places. So I, we we hang out by playing games. And I don't think I had like many outdoors activities available because my, my parents and my, my friends weren't much into this kind of activity. 
maybe once a year for a vacation or something. So I, I think this was like kind of the, the best alternative. I also used to read a lot of books as a kid, and I think I was always a very kind of introverted kid. I always like spend time by myself and you know do activities by myself and. Yeah, it was either. Books, I, I think games, what I'm whatever. trying to get to is: do you, do you think that uh, gaming addiction can be a result of not having other stimulus? Do you... I think it can. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And I want to just move on to something else, which is kind of serious and very topical at the moment. Do you think this total reality, sort of virtual reality world, immersive world that you go into, uh, sort of anesthetizes you from real life in a certain sense? In as much as we're looking at the moment uh, on the streets of Britain, uh, an epidemic in, in knife crimes, in stabbings, etc. Do you think there could be any possible link between that and people getting in, in, involved in this, this virtual reality world that you've said there are no consequences in there? So people are now bringing that out onto the streets. Do you think that's a possibility? Personally, I don't think there's much of a link between okay. these types of video games or experiences and real world violence and crime. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who played a lot of violent video games, I, um, I wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> no, I get um, that, James. But it's, <laughs> I think those kind of things are a lot more deep-rooted, maybe with home life or certain um, uh, situations that you might have grown up in. Um, I think the virtual reality world is definitely a problem um, because it's especially with games becoming so realistic and so immersive, it's even easier now for you to become lost in these worlds. Um, I remember growing up, all I wanted <clears throat> was kind of this world where I could just go into it and live, basically. Right. And that is probably going to be very real. Within a few years, you could spend your whole life. Um, yes, we had a witness this, that yeah. spent 48 hours living in virtual reality, so mm. I can't imagine that, you know. <laughs> but there's just one last uh, uh, question if I may, Chair, um, and it's about these loot boxes. Now, I understand that they are not just rewards, they're also a form of gambling. Do you, do you kind of, you, you buy a loot box and then you might get what you want, but then you don't get what you want, so you have to keep buying them until you get somewhere close to what you want. And, and we live in a world now of the never-ending game, so that, you know, in, back in the day you say you used to pay your £20 to buy the... The, the CD and you'd stick it in the computer and you'd play a game and you'd eventually win you'd, or w w whatever but, but you'd play this never ending game with these never ending loot boxes so you pay for the game again and again and again but it is, it's more than just buying the game it's gambling, am I right on that? So for example on a game Counter Strike mm. you'd, um, they'd release crates every few months and it'd be quite a big thing in the community because some of the items you get from it could sell uh, for real world money of about 500 to 1,000 pounds when they first come out, just for a, a knife on the screen that looks nice. It's got nice mm. colours on it. Mm. Um, and so basically you buy keys for these crates, you just press a button and it says automatically buy a key, links to your PayPal, takes the money out of two clicks, and you see a, a wheel spinning on your screen going over all the items you could get, and eventually it stops on something that you it's didn't not really very want. Good. Yeah. yeah, and it's I think to get a good item it's like a point not one percent chance or something. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> so, so I don't know how that comes. Clearly, that could then lead to a further addiction, not just a gaming addiction, then a gambling addiction. We're talking yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. So, which you could take out into the into the world and start playing yeah. roulette or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I had that issue on FIFA the football game um, because you buy packs of say seven players. And there's a lot of football players in the world. <laughs> so you only get seven at a time with a very, very, very small chance of getting anything good to make a better team. And, and you're trying to get the perfect team, and you sort yeah. of never will. Is that the way? Pretty much, yeah. Unless you play... You either have to play hundreds and hundreds of hours, which people did, uh, or you have to spend money. And every time a new FIFA came out in September, I think it is, on top of the £50 for the game... Me and my friends would probably spend another £150 of our student loan if. on these points just to get loads of packs so that we could start with a great team Yeah. and play. It, it, it was, <laughs> yeah. and, and if you didn't have the right team, you kind of weren't the cool guy. That, that was well, yeah, you couldn't win, really. It's, 
Yeah. You needed the team to be able to win and get these trophies to and get. And at the time, points. it was insidious. You didn't realise it was happening. You were just kind of part of that scene, and that's yeah, it's just like normal. <clears throat> yeah, okay. it's completely normal. Uh, uh, Thank to encourage you to behave that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, it's so to get one. It's called a gold pack. You, know, it's, you take seven and a half thousand coins, for example, or you could spend. I think it was one pound. Now seven and a half thousand coins is roughly. Trying to do the math, twenty-five games of fifteen minutes each. Right. I'm not going, I'm not going to do that maths, but it's a lot of yeah. time just to get one pack. Uh, and so it's become so easy just to, oh yeah, it's just a pound, just ten pounds. And you just and don't notice, and it builds up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's insidious. Okay, thank you. Bye, yeah, Thank you. Can I say th thank you very much for for coming? Here. I we produce a report that does justice to. You know, the evidence you've given, thanks for being so frank, because uh, it, it really is uh, an education for me. Can I, can I just start by asking, I, will, I'm gonna, I know you're sitting there patiently, I'm, gonna, can I, I'm actually going to ask you some questions in a second, but can I just start by saying about game quitters? Um, uh, so so was it, it was your decision, each of you, to, to go to game quitters. There was no one behind you, no one forced you, no one threw your laptop out the window and said, I've had enough, you know, go and sort this out. It was you, your choice, mm -hmm. and uh, do you think there's that there are? That, that, does that set you out from other people? Are other people just long suffering unless somebody else steps in and says to them, "You've got a problem. You've got to stop." If you had the character to do it for yourselves. I think because the the, the founder of Being Quitters also was was letting himself, and he he tells his story how he overcame it and how he created this community. And I think that really speaks to all of us because he. Now we know there's other people who are dealing with the same problems and who have the same issues as we do. And it was just a very, it was the place where people kind of understood what you were going through and they would support you in making the right choice, making the right decisions. So it was a very easy decision to, to join Game Quitters and to like, be a part of the community because it was a very helpful community. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be helpful if um, games had a pop-up on them that, that, that reminded people, you know, not just how long, they've been playing, but uh, um, where they could, if you think you've got a problem, this is the place to go? I, think that, I don't think that would make much of a difference. Really? It would, you just click off it. You know, if you're that engaged in a game, you just won't care, I don't think, if a little pop-up comes up. Um, they used to have their own games back when I was maybe 10, saying, oh, you've been playing for a while, why don't you go and take a 15-minute break? You never did. You just, yeah. <laughs> you just, you you just don't think anyone would respond. There's no, I think there's some not a percentage of people that would. Maybe a few people might, but then they'd just be. But, but the problem ones won't. Yeah, there'd be outrage on okay. social media, on the internet. Right. Th th uh, th 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 thanks for that. And, uh, and so, what, when, when you went to uh, Game Quitters, what, what, what actually did they do to, to help you turn yourselves mm -hmm. around and stop being uh, uh, you know, addicts to uh, mm -hmm. gaming? Well, they don't really do anything, they right. just give you the tools. Um, so what are they? The main thing is the online support forum, where there's tens of thousands of people who journal every single day. When you do this 90 day challenge to quit gaming, which is what the, the first thing you're introduced to is, um, you've got all these people <coughs> writing every single day what they're doing, um, what they've replaced gaming with, their hobbies, how they're trying to cope with it. Um, there's loads of sections of health, lifestyle, um, maybe entrepreneurship, photography, music, all these different things. You can engage in and meet people. Um, I've met people through it. Uh, I've made friends through it. And I think that's, that's pretty much the main <coughs> thing of Game Quitters, along with there's an optional um, program you can buy. It's, I think it's 15 or 20 pounds or something that gives you a lot more tools. There's also YouTube videos from Game Quitters. But the owner, the owner and a good friend of mine, Cam, he's recorded all himself and has, just gives you a whole load of resources to go out and do this on your own. So I add like the videos, they are very useful because they have, there's an answer for each individual problem or each individual issue you might have with quitting gaming. There's ideas how to make new friends, there's videos on how to, I don't know, have a good diet, how to have, a, you know, how to 
do your work, how to replace, there's lots of ideas how to replace games, there's lots of ideas on what to do when you have cravings, what to do when, you, when you're depressed because people, you, know, you quit games and then you don't know what to do with yourself and everything seems you know, very, very bleak. There, and there's lots of ideas of how to replace games. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the, it's the forum which is useful, but also like you, you, you know what to do now. Like there's, you, get, you basically get a... Get a, get a so I saw a far enough. Okay, okay. <laughs> So you get a, a goal to, to aim towards, or you get a, a path towards kind of recovery, and that's I think that's very useful. The 90 day challenge, there's lots of different programs you can buy or you can you can watch online. So there's there's the, there's the support, but there's also the, the, the way forward. Well, the first thing when you go on is a, a sheet, a link to download for free. I think it's 100 hobby ideas or something, mm -hmm. just right. to look at straight away. So right, okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that. And the, so. You, you were asked earlier on about loot boxes, and, and um, did you did you ever run up any debts? Not to that extent, no. Just because I had quite a bit of money at university from student loans, and from the fact that Swansea is so cheap to live in, <laughs> it was great. Um, but I never really took it that far. I know people who have. You hear stories of people, even maybe a 40, 50 year old father who's racked up thousands of pounds of debt, and cause ruin for his family, mm -hmm. but personally, no, not for me. No, it wasn't a problem for you, but but, but you, you could see ways that people easily could be yeah. enticed. If you were, had tendencies towards gambling, like real um, addiction to gambling already, and you mm -hmm. went down this path, I think it could very well, very easily affect you. So, so the sort of gambling that took place in gaming didn't lead you to, you, you to uh, try gambling in other forums? You've never done things like... Uh, uh, for instance, skin gambling on social media. Yeah, I've done. I did football betting in university. Right. Um, I went through a little bit of a phase for about a month where I got into match betting. It's like a way of making money yeah. in university. But then I realised I'm just gambling <laughs> in my time. Like, why am I doing this? Um, but it was, yeah, it's right. never really had the issue. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much. So, so Jack. How did you become a, 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 a <laughs> blog influencer on, on that is a YouTube good question. and social media? <clears throat> For me, I was just quite precocious when I was younger and I just really wanted to write. Um, and so I, I wrote to loads of local newspapers just asking if I could have a column. And they said, no, you're 13, of course you can't. <laughs> and so then I made a blog um, and started kind of documenting um, what I was doing and like sharing my kind of perspectives on, on things. And then eventually people started to listen, which was nice, <laughs> and um, kind of respond and uh, became a bit of a community. And then that developed into, now YouTube is kind of my main platform of kind of speaking to a camera and uploading that to the internet. So, yeah. so are you addicted? I'd like to say no. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I think there are addictive tendencies. Um, I think it's less, it's more of a covert addiction because it's, it's not so much as sitting for, like you said, like eight hours or something in, on a game. You you kind of it's more living your normal life, everyday life, and checking your phone every now and then, and it's always in your pocket and just like just checking that one notification, which turns into scrolling for ten minutes, but you know four times an hour or something. So it's <laughs> so. So what do you what do you have to contribute every day as a blogger? To, to, Me, so how much um, of your time? Do you yeah. Have? So my kind of side of the internet, I suppose, is um, about access to higher education. I was the first person in my family to go to university, and so um, my channel. I there were a lot of unanswered questions that I had before I went, um, and loads of anxieties that I had. And so when I went to university, I just started filling in the gaps with and making content. I vlogged my freshers week, which was um, <laughs> probably risky to do. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, yeah, I film um, a lot of days in my life where I just share, this is what I'm doing at university today. This is how I found my house to live in for second year and how to rent a house as a 19 year old because I didn't, no one was really there to tell me how to do that. Um, and so I just became that voice to, I hope, <laughs> to help other people and then people responded really kindly to it and um, so then it kind of becomes a supply and demand thing where people ask questions and then you kind of make the content to answer them. Um, so for me like that side of social media is a really positive one because we help each other and it's a very, uh, the communication 
between, so I get a lot of people who are going to university and they're terrified about moving away from home. And I think listening to a young person who has recently experienced that exact scenario, because um, I moved about 350 miles away from home. So it wasn't just a, oh, I'll pop home for dinner kind of scenario or I've got a bit of washing, I'll, I'll run that home. You know, it's, it's a long way. Um, and so I think just hearing that from a young person and being like, it's going to be okay. Um, it's reassuring. Um, so is, do you feel under pressure? Um, yeah, so I, I study an English literature degree and so there's a lot of pressure on my grammar and punctuation and spelling and everything like that and every time um, <laughs> there's a big, with the American viewers there's a lot of, oh, uh, don't think that letter's got a U, that word's got a U in it and I'm like, actually, <laughs> it does but there is a kind of, people really pick at things that you do and um, what I share is, I suppose would come under the lifestyle category and so people do look at your life and, and, and pick it apart and question things that you do and, oh, don't you have an essay to be writing or shouldn't you be? And I think the main thing that I always say is you, this video that you saw perhaps of um, my week, which is 10 minutes long, or this video is say 20 minutes long, you know, that, that whole week was so much more than those 20 minutes that you saw. And I think that's the main thing that we as content creators have a responsibility to do is to keep um, informing people that this is uh, an edited um, lifestyle that you're seeing mm. so it's not um, and it, especially it's a highlights reel um, is the main thing that's I think that's where social media gets harmful is forgetting that it's not just one person's highlights reel but everyone's highlights reel so, all uh, at once. so, so do you say so, so if you weren't real that people would suss you out very quickly <laughs> yeah I think so I think it's hard to not be authentic and realistic or in that sense because you're essentially a personality mm. and so people I think respond to you as a as a human being. So it's yeah. it's kind of different to the uh, the gaming side that you were talking about. It's more personable. You can see my face. You can see yeah. me talking. Yeah. Um, and a response to the comments and stuff. And yeah. So so uh, as, as someone with such a presence on Instagram and, uh, yeah. and YouTube, so to do, do uh, advertisers approach you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I um, I'm signed with a management agency who um, helped me with um, kind of. Speaking to brands, I'm at university, I don't really have time to be, yeah. you know, negotiating. And also, um, when I first started doing it, uh, I think the first time I was paid to do something online, I was 16. And so, at that point, when someone said, how much do you want for it? I didn't know. Um, and it's, it's this whole new world and this whole new industry where we're all kind of trying to navigate it um, and working it all out for ourselves of what, what we are worth. But I think the important thing to remember is that it's the, it should come under the entertainment industry, I think. Um, and so we essentially what we do is we create content which is free. Right. Um, so so yeah. Just so so, so I, I, I'm clear. You, you you do get an income from now as a result of setting up. Yeah. And, and you didn't set out to do that. That's just the consequence. No, of what no. I think um, the main thing for me, and especially now because I, I remember seeing a survey of uh, of primary school children where they they went into a class and they asked them what they wanted to be when they were older, and I think sixty percent said a YouTuber which is technically, my, well, that's my job. Right. And, you know, when I was that age, this, didn't, this, this wasn't a career prospect. It wasn't, a, right. it wasn't something you could aspire to be. It just it didn't exist. Right. Um, and for me, I never set out to be a YouTuber or to be, like, uh, an influencer, as people call it. I just tried to make content that would help people. And then I think because of that, because it was authentic, people responded to it. Um, and then it... it kind of developed into that. Right. Um, so, so is it, a, you know, you, you, you can live off being a, a YouTuber or influencer? Yeah. Okay. It's right. a job. I'm not going to ask you what your income is, but, no. you know, but, no, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, thank, th thanks for that. So, so um, how do you, when you enter into an arrangement with somebody who's uh, going to pay you, yeah. um, how do you judge whether they're an appropriate person to, or organisational body to, uh, yeah. to associate with? I think the issue with that is that it's completely down to your discretion. And um, for, for me, um, I've always been very lucky in that, you know, there have been um, a lot of opportunities. And so I've been, or, but I think I've always been very aware that I am, whether I intend to or not, um, speaking to an impressionable audience who value my opinion perhaps more than just a random person that they met on the street, kind of, <laughs> because I have that platform. Um, and so I think that we have as content creators, a moral obligation to remember, you know, that these, the people who watch us are also consumers, not just of our content, but also of the brands that we promote. 
And so when you align yourself with a brand, it has to be something that you completely believe in. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I would always try and test out a product first. Um, you know, and I think the issue is obviously when money comes into it, people can be tempted. Mm. For me personally, I would always test a product first to make sure it was something I actually enjoyed and, and liked using. Um, even if I worked with a brand, for example, um, I worked with a laptop company, and it wasn't the company that I, my actual laptop is that I use on a daily basis. But so what I did when I made content for them is I, I tested it out first, and I was like, yeah, I like this laptop, it's good. And so when I made the content, I used it in the video to show exactly what it did. And I didn't lie, I didn't say this is my laptop, I just said, I'm gonna use this laptop for a week and show you what it can do. And that, so, you know, I think that's a more fair way of doing it. But, but that, yeah. that, that judgment is down to you as an individual, not... Well, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and so do you think that this is an unregulated area of activity on social media um, that needs to be regulated, or...? I think it's, it's an impossible mission, almost, because it's the same way that any company can advertise on the television, mm -hmm. in, you know, to a, to a certain degree. If they're an established company, and they can advertise on the television. Um, it's the same way. Um, you know, YouTube is essentially just another entertainment platform, or, mm. or social media is another entertainment platform that people can pay to advertise on. Um, and the influencer marketing side of it is just a person holding up this product rather than mm. an advert before the video saying, check out this product. Mm. So I think, yeah, but when, when you add that personal level, I feel an obligation to know that this person who values my opinion and watches my videos could buy this mm. and spend their hard earned money on this <laughs> and, and so you know so just just last last uh, 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 question is, um... <laughs> is that my point surreal experience uh, so so uh, uh, as somebody who's on social media a lot, is there, are there things going on there that you would uh, want to draw to our attention that you say, you know, this is something you should look into? For instance, you know, the issue about uh, free betting on, on so social yeah. media that entices young people into you know, skin betting and, uh, yeah. and playing poker. I think there, yeah, there are um, issues with that. I think that these, these betting companies could still advertise regardless of whether they asked me or if they just paid you know, to have a billboard or like a, a sign on the tube or something, you know, it's, I think it's, it needs to be regulated probably in the same way. Um, I just think there are so many complications in terms of which companies can do that because essentially they just approach you. Um, I think one of the main issues that I would flag up is in terms of education around social media because when I was growing up, I, the whole education around social media was about like, don't talk to strangers online, but that's impossible now. You know, my career essentially is based on talking to strangers online. Um, and it's given me amazing opportunities. Like I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't talk to strangers online. I wouldn't, I've um, done presenting work for the BBC. We have a number one podcast. Like it, there are so many opportunities that I've gained at the age of 20 now where, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do that without talking to strangers online. So that's <laughs> one side of it. And I think it's just remembering the main thing I think we need to focus on in educating young people is that, again, what I said earlier, it's a highlights reel and it's a, an edited life that isn't necessarily wholly accurate. You know, uh, people take pictures of world famous landmarks and Photoshop bits out to make it look more aesthetically pleasing, which is absurd to me because they're landmarks they already are. You know, super exciting and incredible to go and see. Um, so I think it's really important for us to emphasize, especially to young people who are so impressionable, that. Uh, you know, this is uh, an edited life that is made to look perfect so that isn't necessarily exactly like that. And also the people who you are watching can be paid to promote a product. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I know there are members who want to respond to some things that have been said, but I think yeah. we'll take Simon and Joe um, for next and then we'll go into topical questions mode. <laughs> 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 have you... I had you down for a but are you, are you, I, I you, wanted to ask a slightly serious question about um, uh, on the mental health issues. Is that now a good moment to do that? Yes, yes. It, it, yeah. it's, it's following on really from something James said earlier on, uh, and uh, I mean, there's been various committees and inquiries within within Parliament over the last few months. You've probably seen most of them about uh, um, 
online intimidation and bullying and the sort of long-term effects that that may have, the anonymity that can sometimes uh, come with it. Um, and alongside that, we're seeing this extraordinary statistic of uh, uh, teenage suicide rate going up by sort of 67 percent in the last 10 years. I don't want to, you know, force, by any means, sort of force you into just sort of expressing a view um, if you don't want to. But is the is is it reasonable to for, for us to even explore the possibility that there may be a connection between uh, sort of social media uh, addiction, social media activity, yeah. and sort of serious mental health consequences? Of that is that an avenue down which we should or could go? Yeah, I think that there's a huge correlation. I think that uh, if you're having a bad day and you click onto Instagram and instantly at the touch of a button you have everyone's best day of their life right in front of you that can be really harmful and you know even though my a lot of people message me being like oh your life is so perfect and everything's going so well but you know I don't show <laughs> absolutely everything that's going on ever um, because it would firstly be impossible but also you know we want to keep certain things private and, and that kind of thing so I think that um, it can be very easy to see other people always thriving and um, enjoying themselves and it almost seems like it's constant and you know you now on um, social media like instagram and snapchat you can have these it's like a stories function so people upload uh, you know um, on the go um so once you click one then you press next and it takes you to the next person's one and then the next person's one you can go down a hole of watching you know 100 people's days and it's the highlights reel so i think that that's the biggest thing to me and i think that can affect your mental health if you see I think it's, uh, it would be a situation of thinking, well, why, why isn't my life like that? Why isn't my day like that? Why aren't I on that holiday that you're on? That looks amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so, and you've got you know, huge reach, which as you just discovered we were... Which um, is extended to the best room. But do you see yourself as having a role in trying to help people who may be... Um, victims in, you know, of, of, of that kind of world? Yeah, I... Like I said before, I have a, I feel like I have a moral obligation to, to talk about that. Um, and so we set up this, um, this podcast, which um, was all about... So there's a kind of group of us who online are kind of... A lot of people talk about us as having kind of a lot of academic success and being at university and, and that kind of thing. And so we've made a, a podcast about failure um, called The Wooden Spoon to talk about coming last and, and owning it and kind of embracing the, the imperfections. And um, I think it's really important for us as people who um, portray uh, a lifestyle that is kind of um, really motivated and, and productive and proactive, but to also show, you know, this isn't every second of every day and we can talk about the things that we, when, when we trip up and, and things don't go to plan. And um, we're not saying don't fail, we're saying everyone fails, so how can we pick ourselves up and turn it into a success? So I think that in that was kind of a very conscious thing that we wanted to do to talk about you know this is uh how as young people we can accept that life isn't actually this perfect bubble that social media you know depicts it as um and we speak about mental health as well on on, on the podcast so you know i think it's important to hear it from young people my um, my, my last question on this mm. so from understanding that when james was talking earlier on it was um about the one of the points he made very persuasively was about yeah. the, the, the impact on mental health from an addiction to mm. online gaming. Yeah. Does that necessarily translate across to other online activities or, or just uh, people's um, obsession with um, connection with um, uh, social media? Um, yeah. Because I, I wonder if the two things are connected, and how you them as a, as an influencer then draw the line <laughs> yeah. between making sure your business works, which relies on loads of people spending loads of time on your on your yeah. particular uh, YouTube channel, whatever it is, um, and at the same time recognizing that actually that might be addictive in itself. How do you uh, yeah? Where do you draw? Um, I think one of the most interesting things that that you said that I kind of picked up on in relation to social media was about the kind of. Um, endless universe of possibilities of where you know when you go into this like fantasy world um you can keep you know getting a, a, a new outfit for your character and stuff and in a way social media is also this endless you know when you go onto the internet because there are <laughs> so many people on the planet and you know a, a vast majority will be on social media now will kind of there's always someone to talk to there's always someone awake there's always someone 
sharing something. Um, and there's always something to discuss, and there's always you know nuances to that discussion that you can you know you can just fall down these rabbit holes. And um, so I definitely think that that is really interesting as a comparison. Um, also, the idea of kind of on on football games building your perfect team, and it's it's impossible to have the perfect team. I think that social media is the same thing because it's based on numbers. So the you know on your photo, if you get a certain number of likes, and if that's the most likes you've ever got then the next time you post a photo, you want to get more. So I think that there's a kind of, yeah. in a way, but we, we don't talk about it in, that, in, those ad, ad, in the terminology of addiction um, because it feels more like real life. It just feels like our everyday, it's, I could post a photo right now, I won't, I won't but, <laughs> you know, exactly. and, then, and then maybe I'd be like, oh, will that get more likes than what I posted last week? Yeah. And will that be more successful? So I think that there's, a, there's definitely a kind of, you can never reach perfect because you can never have everyone in the world following you. So you kind of want to keep going up to that point. And whether that's on the platform that I have, where I, you know I'm lucky to do it as a as a job, but there's also kids in school who want to get more followers to have more than the per other per people in class. Um, so I think there's a competitiveness um, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Stevens. Thank you, Jack. Can I ask you? Do you monitor your screen time? Um, I have and was <laughs> terrified when I when I looked. I was mortified when I when I saw how much time I spent on screen. Yeah, but you don't do it as a matter of course. No, um, I th yeah. I think for me, especially because it is a job as well. Like I do end up spending a lot of time. But for for me as well, there's um, because I'm really lucky to have a really dedicated um, group of viewers and stuff to, who um, are so engaged with everything that I do. So as soon as I post something, there's a response, and in a way, it is hard especially when people are talking about you um, with youtube comments um like i said before it's kind of um me sharing my lifestyle so i'll share like an authentic honest week in my life at university and then people in the comment section will like pick different things about it, about like my relationships with certain people um and you know up to, yeah like i said before about grammar and things like that and um it is people do really pick things apart and so it, for me it's kind of it's really hard not to Read, the, read all of the things when, when people are, are replying. So. And, and you said a few minutes ago that yeah. um, you want to keep some things private. Yeah. So, you know, much of your adult life so far is online for the yeah. world to see. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll ever regret having that sort of exposure and, and displaying that much of yourself to the world? Yeah, I mean, my, I've always tried to uh, prioritise like good, having a good influence. And... Um, I've never promoted gambling or, or anything like that. I've, I've been really lucky to work with like the United Nations and a lot of charities and stuff. And that is more where I think this is so valuable and it's, it's so cool that we get to share these things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of regretting things, I think that now we're a lot more aware of our digital footprints. And I think we're aware of... Because it's also a kind of curation of a, of a feed and a, an aesthetic and what you share. I think we're all very aware of our online identities now as young people um, more so than when I was growing up I know there's a lot of um, there have been kind of scandals on uh, with te television shows where uh, celebrities go on and then uh, you know tweets that they've written 10 years ago are kind of resurfaced and, and and that kind of thing so I think that we just need to be aware of how much we share and that it's there forever once I press publish it's, it's that's it and then even if I delete it, I think, you know, somewhere in some kind of, I don't know how it works, but some kind of coding will keep that forever. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just making sure that young people are aware of that. Um, even now with kind of private messages and stuff, I think we need to be aware of what you're posting online is, is, is a permanent thing. Um, and if a screenshot <coughs> is taken and then shown out of context, you know, you're, it has your name next to it and your profile. Which and how do you think it's best to educate people, and not just young people, because mm. obviously yeah, older yeah. people use social media, you know, how, how best do you think we should ed educate people about, um, about the sort of things you've just talked about, yeah. but also about resilience when, mm. when you post stuff online and, and you obviously get responses, some of yeah. them are favourable, some of them are not? Yeah, I think it's the same with sharing any opinion on, on any platform if, or in you know, everyday <laughs> um, discourse. If, if you share an opinion, you have to be prepared to defend it <laughs> and, um, and discuss it. Uh, so I, 
yeah, I think it's something that we're all navigating and trying to work out. It's, a very, it's still a new growing thing. And it's an, what I think is important to remember is it's not going to stop. <laughs> um, whenever we look at dystopias now, they're all about where technology will go next rather than where the technology will stop. Um, and I think that's really telling. Um, and I think it's kind of an... We just have to adapt. Um, in terms of educating, I think we just have to keep talking about the lifestyles that we share and that our online personas being a curation and a... Um, and, and an edited version of things um, and yeah talking about how things your digital footprint does last for a very long time and I don't know how I think it's, it's the problem with it is that it's hard to show someone until it, it's too late yeah. and until it, it, until it bites them and I think that's where the trouble is at the moment I, I personally don't know the solution to, I don't have the answer to how we show someone <laughs> that what you just shared online could an employer could see that in five years' time and not give you a job. Um, but, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably easier to target that in schools um, rather than talking about don't talk to strangers online. It's like we already know that you will, so how can you control that and what you're sharing? Okay. Um, yeah. And you've got, I think it says here, you've got 100, 000, over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube yeah. and over 30,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. I'm very struck listening to the, the evidence today that, yeah. the, you know, we've got three men in, in front of us here. <laughs> yeah. And it seems a very male-dominated area. So do you know, for example, out of your subscribers and followers, whether you've got a balance of men and women or is it predominantly men? I think it's about 65 to 70% female. Right. Um, yeah, I think... Um, I know that obviously here we're all um, men, but in the industry, I, I think that the separation is is much... Uh, I, think, I think there is kind of some sort of equality in terms of representation. Um, so you're talking about if presenters on YouTube, effectively? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the main kind of media example, I don't know if you know of, like, Zoella, who is mm -hmm. kind of, she's in the millions of subscribers and she has her own products in Superdrug and she's made a, a real kind of business out of it. And she's now a, essentially a brand. Um, and so I think that there is some sort of representation. The interesting thing is that the, the most followed people on the internet are generally gamers, which <laughs> I think... Um, Probably, um, statistically speaking, will probably most the audience of that will mostly be be males. Um, but then there's also this hugely flourishing um, beauty and um, lifestyle industry as well, which obviously like will appeal more to girls, um, stereotypically speaking. Um, so I think that there are kind of, and you know, people can be interested in both or I, either or, um, of course. Um, so I think that. I, d I don't think it's a male-dominated sphere, okay. personally. And you've led me very neatly, thank yeah. you, to ask um, James and Matus about that, because, again, the impression I get is that the gaming world is very male-dominated, both in terms of the developers, um, people who play the games, um, and the people that develop behavioural um, or compulsive behaviour as a result of the gaming. It's, I'm interested to know, when, when you played games... Were you normally in those games where you're playing with a community? Were they normally men? Yeah. Probably 95% at least, um, if not higher. <laughs> it's, um, and why is that? I think, um, I thought about this recently actually, and uh, I think it's due to the competitive nature of gaming, and the guys tend to be a bit more, they try and one up each other and be a bit more competitive with each other. But there's been quite a big um, insurgence recently of women saying, hang on, we play games as well, we're gamers. Like a huge amount of mm -hmm. people, but they don't tend to identify as gamers. No. Um, so like bingo games is predominantly female. Yeah, yeah for example. and uh, <laughs> a lot of mobile gaming as well. Mm. But I've, personally, I haven't seen women take gaming quite as far as men do, playing hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. It's only men that I've seen do that. And I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. I just want to add that in the games I've played, the very competitive team-oriented games, usually when there's a game, when there's a girl on a team and she speaks out, or it becomes known that it's a it's a woman. She'll get harassed, like, mm. and if she makes a mistake, like her mistakes are amplified because guys will be like, "Oh, it's a girl. She doesn't know how to play it well." And that's it's always been like that. Like, I, I usually I play with my friends who are all guys, but just the way we can talk about it, it's, it's very 
it's a very kind of stereotypical way. And if, if there's a girl we play with, then it's, well, not anymore, but, you know, it used to be like a big fun of the girl or like it used to be that the girl would be kind of under specific. She would be looked at very, very, as a girl, not as a, as a person, but as a girl. And I think that can be off-putting to, to girls. Mm. And it sounds very much like experiences 30, 40 years ago when girls who wanted to play football, you know, exactly the same thing. And it's gone, it's gone full circle. Um, um, I don't know if it's, there's also a recent, um, there's a, a beauty guru, um, from America called James Charles, so he's, he's a, a male who oh, yeah. um, came to the UK and he had, uh, they shut down kind of a whole shopping centre because so many people adore what he does. And um, it, was on, it was on the news and um, the, the presenter made a kind of comment just after they showed this montage talking about how she takes her makeup tips from women. Um, and so I think there is still that kind of weird um, thing of still assigning genders to, like, gaming is for men, beauty is for women, but... Yeah. The, the beauty of the internet is that we can cross those borders and we can show, we can show people that actually anyone can get involved in, in these things and, and we, we need to break down those walls in it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can see from what you say it's, yeah. it's different in, in your sector, mm. but in gaming, yeah. it's so stark. This is mm -hmm. what, it, it stands out to me and what, what worries me. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you both, James and Motus, is... When you were playing games, when you actually stopped playing, did you find that your behaviour and what you were doing in the game then seeped over into your behaviour once you'd stopped playing? So that kind of pressurised, um, competitive nature, you know, did, did you find that your behaviour changed if you'd been playing games? For me, for me somewhat, yes. And then I, when I stopped playing games, I would, have, I would have to find a replacement for the competitive and the kind of goal oriented activity. So I, I had I still have to have something like that. And I think I think of it as a good thing because I think, you know, if I have some kind of goal, if I have something to work towards, then I'm more likely to kind of get there. And I I, I like that I have some goal oriented activities. And there's obviously a lot of kind of lingo I've learned, a lot of skills I would say and lots of things I picked up over the years of playing games which I still kind of use or maybe I think about different things and in ways which are related to the games, and I still, I still, you know, I sit in the lecture and I just randomly in my head pops up a thought of like me playing a game when I was 15. So it's still something that's very much with me in, in some way, but I think I've learned to channel the, the, the way I play games and the energy I've played, put into playing games into different, but maybe similar avenues. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I would say like, I not game anymore, but I, I program, I, I make kind of, I'm involved in the digital kind of sphere. I, I'm, I think I, I like computers, I like to work with computers. And I think that has come from me playing games for all these years and being involved with computers in a very intimate way, I would say. Yeah. James, did you want to add anything? Um, I don't think I took anything, like the specific things that I did in the games. But I did notice that, because I always tended towards games that focused on exploration, single player mm -hmm. games in these wide open worlds. I found it quite funny that now I'm a freelance entrepreneur. I went on an expedition to Canada last year and I've done all these things out in the world that I love exploring. Mm. I don't know if it's like some deep-rooted thing in me that wants to explore and then I took that into gaming and subsequently channeled that once I quit. I don't know. But, okay. yeah. and my final question, earlier on I can't remember, I think some of you were talking about it, about whether or not you should have limit, time limits on games and I think the suggestion came up, you know, if you play for three hours you should then stop and uh, that would equate to say 21 hours a week. I just wondered, do any of you watch television in real time at all? Because no. generationally, you know, around this table, we probably all used to spend 21 hours watch, a week watching television when we were growing up. Yeah, my parents spend um, more than that now, I think. And yeah. I tell them, so yeah, they had so a go at me for playing games, and I say, but you watch, yeah. you're, on your, you're on Facebook scrolling while the TV's on for hours a day. I'm like, that's no difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, we and have a, a television in my student house, which I think we turned <laughs> on twice this year. And they were both for things that were, you know, they were live events. Yeah. Um, that we, we sat down and watched but we would all watch things on our laptops and, yeah. and um, well it's the thing so, yeah. we, now it's a lot about YouTube and, um, and gaming I don't know if you've heard of Twitch mm -hmm. um, so it's like when I was playing games I'd have someone else playing games on my other screen and I'd watch them playing while playing yeah. and it's, <laughs> it's like such a huge 
like Twitch is huge now, and YouTube, the gaming side of that, you can watch hours upon hours upon hours of content just non-stop related to gaming. And I think a lot of people have become quite normalised just to binge watching YouTube and Netflix in the same way that people might watch TV. Yeah. Um, and they, they come home from work and they sit and watch Netflix for five hours. And again, I, it's quite normal for people and I just think that's not really normal. <laughs> it's like, we, I mean, it's from the side of things that I get to do um, online, it's kind of, there's almost a positive spin to that. And I, uh, well, we, uh, this community kind of called, it's kind of developed the name like StudyTube where people will sit and study for hours and then people kind of study alongside it. And I think that's almost a complete inversion of what you were saying. It's kind of almost like a productive. Where were you um, when you were supposed to when I was <laughs> But that's, you know, I, and I, uh, there, there's this whole side of, you, of YouTube which is kind of like study with me and get productive with me and let's, you know, and, and I've done video, I've made videos like those and people react so overwhelmingly positively to them. Um, and that's really cool to be able to see your influence in the real world of seeing you, you've actually helped someone who was struggling to find the motivation to start working, yeah. to, to do it. So I think, there, you know, we can use it in a positive way as well. Because yeah. on the other yeah. side, you've got three hours of, like, yeah. making an eight-year-old cry. Something. Oh, my God, I made this eight-year-old yeah. cry playing Fortnite. Like, you could watch hours of content like that. <laughs> I don't, but, I mean, you could if you wanted to. And there's, there's the there's thing this, with YouTube is you can go from one to the other. Yeah, almost it's the rabbit hole of yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We've got a few more questions. I'll yeah. start off. Um, Jack, you said earlier on that there are... Um, there are things that you sort of. There are things you will talk about in in, in your films, and things you won't. Mm -hmm. How how rigorously do you police that line? I mean, do you do you ever feel under pressure to say if someone says, "Well, you know, perhaps if you talked about this, you'd get even more views for, for the um, film." I definitely think there's a way of. Uh, I, the term that we would use is clickbait. So people, mm -hmm. you know, um, the same way that if an advert popped up on your screen, it was kind of enticing. The, the buzzwords would would make you click on, and I think that people use that to their advantage on YouTube as well. Um, not always in what I would consider a good way, in a positive way. Um, for me, the distinction has always been my like private life in terms of relationships, family. Um, my family have never really been on my channel unless they kind of were um, kind of in the background or around or were kind of consenting to be on it. Um, uh, yeah, I think that for me it's really important, especially with my housemates, to make sure they're kind of comfortable with it as well. Um, because even though I choose to put my personal and sometimes private life on the internet, it's something that's edited and, and um, I oversee all of that. So it, it's edited by me, mm. but it's, their lives are then edited by me as well. So then I would always kind of check with them if that was okay. So they always watch them before they go on the internet and stuff. And they, I'll always be like, oh, is it okay if I just film quickly? Mm. Um, so I think that that's a really important distinction to make is to make sure that everyone is aware of what's, what you're sharing. Yeah. Because we can talk a lot about being careful of what you share, but then it's also about what you share of other people, which can also reflect negatively on them later down the line. So I think it's important to make sure that everyone is aware of what is being published. Yeah. I think the important word actually is publish, because it's, I think to me that makes it sound a lot more permanent. Um, Kind of share just sounds a bit like you're just in conversation with someone and it could be forgotten, but published to me sounds very much like it's in print. Um, and I think thinking about it in those terms is really useful. In a, in a typical week, how much footage do you film? Um, so I try to upload at least like one video a week. Um, but how, how, because you said edited down, so how much is filmed? Oh, uh, okay, so probably an hour and a half's worth of footage edited down to 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, but then also, obviously, in the meantime, there's also... Instagram posts every day and there's tweets as it comes to my head and yeah. goes <laughs> into the Twitter sphere, if yeah. that's a word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, okay. so I think it's, it's almost, there's a constant sharing. Yeah. You, you said earlier on that there's a film, I think you used the expression living your normal life, but do, but do you think, but how much do you plan ahead? Because I mean, there could be a, yeah. a, a slight danger, obviously you want, you want people to engage with the films. So oh, you for think sure. about making them interesting. I mean, is, yeah. to what extent is it your normal life or is it a life that you've you've imagined for that week as something that other people would find interesting? Yeah, I think that with um, when I share about university, I'm probably quite different in terms of because of what the, the um, niche of what I share. But because it's university, I do try and obviously I, I, if it's an interesting week coming up, then I think, oh, I'll film this. Yeah. Um, and 
what I realised, because I, I don't know about you, but before I did any of this, I wouldn't have ever thought that anyone would care about me studying for my exams. But people do, because it's something they can relate to, and especially for young people who, it's, it's not always, you, know, you don't always know what they should revise for their history A-level. So I've made videos about, this is how I revised for my history A-level that I've now attained. <laughs> um, and I think it, I just didn't, I'd never thought of it in those terms, but it is really, people want to see normality. Um, and they do respond well to it, really positively in fact. Um, however, obviously there are things that are constructed for entertainment value. So I posted a video last night where my housemate went away for the weekend, so, and she was, she was so chuffed. She went on a free trip to Paris and she was just bragging about it. So we pranked her when she was away and turned her bedroom into a museum. So we put up like placards on all of her stuff. And, yeah. So that, you know, that is constructed. <laughs> yeah, so that's constructed for the camera, do you know what I mean? So th th I think, um, but I almost think it's clear to see when you, w when you watch that that isn't, that that's, that's a specific yeah. event that we... Yes. So how many times a, a day do you post on Instagram? Um, it really varies. I mean, because we have Instagram stories now, which is, yeah. it, it disappears after 24 hours. So yeah. I think that those are kind of as and when. Yeah. Um, but I think it's that, it's that natural human instinct of wanting to share things. Um, and it just gives us a platform to do it. It's like if you go to a, a famous landmark outside Big Ben, you know, everyone's taking pictures of it. Mm. And, um, and so then, you know, it's a place for them to then post it and do something with it and say, look, I'm at Big Ben. Yeah. And for someone else to go, oh, that's really cool. I've always wanted to go. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> I so, mean, maybe not now, not at the moment. But <laughs> um, Final question for me. You, yeah. you said at the beginning that you didn't think... Um, it's right to talk about social media yeah. addiction. Mm. But I wonder, if, is, it, is, it, is it a compulsion? Because people talk a lot about this idea of the fear of missing out, and that people mm. are constantly checking, they get notifications all the yeah. time, they're constantly checking to see if something new has been posted, if they've missed something, uh, they may feel the compulsion to share you know, mm. images of their own life as well in order to be part of that discussion. Do you, do you think there, that is a real thing, that people are yeah, have I, a compulsion to be constantly checking and, I think and engaging? So. I think that... Um, it's uh, something that my housemates and I would do where we'd all just be sitting in the living room and we'd all be scrolling mm. and then share it. Oh, have mm. you seen this? Or, you know, it, and it's that thing of, oh, have you seen what so-and-so's doing? Um, and now when my grandparents phone me, they're like, oh, yeah, I saw that you were doing this. Um, and I don't know if that's a positive or a negative thing in terms of sharing the act of kind of telling one person individually. Um, i definitely say that if one person especially a young person, wasn't sharing on social media, then they would be an anomaly to the kind of general norm. Um, not necessarily to the same extent that I do, but I think people do share. Um, but I, I, I do think it's a natural human instinct to want to kind of show what you're doing and, and to create that discussion. Um, that's yeah. Thanks. Uh, Rebecca and then Clive. I'm just tempted to, would you be writing a blog about this? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Have you picked up some useful info? <laughs> yeah, all noted. All See, lots it all noted. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Always. It may not be the right audience. Right? <laughs> um, I was just, well, actually, it's just one of the statistics in our fake news inquiry it did say that on average, young people, I think, in particular, were looking at their uh, phones 16 times every hour. So. That came out, didn't it? Mm. But to me, that doesn't even that doesn't even that, surprise me at all. Like, no. I mean, yeah. Um, I just it was you made a comment about the uh, the bloggers, uh, particularly in the cosmetics and care yeah. world, because they are massive a lot yeah. of them. And I actually did a PMQ last week about celebrity endorsement of pro of mm -hmm. products. They were actually detox diet products yeah. by some of these celebrities. Mm -hmm. You might have heard something about the what's going on. Yeah. And the celebrities are paid, for example, £100,000 to hold up one product, which isn't tried, isn't tested, yeah. and it's causing, <coughs> according to the NHS, untold problems with young people following these celebs and doing what they want and ending up with issues themselves, particularly women, concerned about body image. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you got a view on that? Because you are actually in that world yourself now. Yeah, um, being someone in that world who... Uh, where you can have a contract shown to you which has a figure on it of money and then it's a product that you don't like. I, you know, I can't trust that everyone would say no, but I, if it's something that I wasn't interested in, I would never promote it. But then it's, uh, it's, it's down to 
individual discretion, I suppose, and it's it, it's hard to, to police that. The point is, there is yeah. no regulation for this now. No. Do you think there should be some kind of regulation in this field? I think that perhaps in terms of um, when it's like weight loss or, or um, cosmetic, I think that's quite important to um, talk about the actual effects and side effects and stuff. And I almost think that perhaps there should be some kind of um, disclaimer. Um, and I would always, dis like we, we all have to share when we've been paid to promote something. So you, ha you have to put hashtag ad. So to, to share that it is a, a paid for promotion, um, which I think is so important. And you, do you, don't, you don't have to write at the bottom, this is an advert effectively, because what you're doing yeah. is advertising. Yeah, yeah. If you're in basically endorsing your product mm. that you're paid to yeah. show. So you have to say hashtag ad. Um, and I definitely think that social media um, personalities are quite closely kind of monitored on that. And I think that people would call each other out if they did, weren't doing it. I think the problem more lies with what, from my experience, is reality stars and that kind of realm who come into this industry almost overnight. You know, when the TV show airs and someone can become an influencer. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's a term that the media and business have picked up on, to call people like me influencers, because it, we essentially influence what other people buy and think and, and that kind of thing. We can share perspectives that they might not have come across before. And in many ways, that's an amazing thing because you can become you know, exposed to something you never would have considered before, like a, a new idea. Um, Your um, hot properties for advertisers though. Yeah, it's, and I think it's a, it's a growing industry and, and more and more huge brands are getting on board with it and realizing the potential of it. Um, but why, I, I think you can see the value of if, you can have a, a one-minute advert between, you know, the X Factor, which people switch off from because that's when they go and make a cup of tea, and it was just they, it's so clearly an advert that, that you kind of almost ignore it. With a with a social media, if you trust my opinion, <laughs> then and then I'm saying this is great. I think it's you're more likely to listen to me, and if I integrate it into my lifestyle and share how I'm using it. But that's the danger, isn't yeah. it, with these celebs? I mean, Kim Kardashian is allegedly one of the yeah. people that's been named. Uh, they, they don't necessarily know how safe the product is, or that's, do you not think it's a dangerous world that needs more regulating? In a way, yes, and I think it, that's definitely down to kind of the cosmetic side of things. Because if I'm sharing a laptop, you kind of can see the, the capabilities of that laptop and you can see what it does. Um, and that's m more probably what I would be involved in, I think when it comes to cosmetics, which can have like dangerous side effects, um, then that's a different um, kettle of fish. But uh, in terms of moderating it, I, personally, I can't see how it would even, how you'd even go about setting some kind of regulation because it's, it's down to personal. And I think it, the companies also, for them to be able to advertise, it should work in the same way as they need kind of approval to be able to advertise and perhaps they should have to share that with an influencer before they can work with them. Um, but I think we've got a long way to go before that. So, so mind you, I, I feel quite addicted because my PMQ has so far had 240,000 views. Amazing. So I can see how you can get hooked mm -hmm. into to the addictiveness of it. <laughs> yeah. And that's... Because know, it's an immediate response. It yeah. Can, can I ask, uh, Jack, have you, have you ever been trolled or bullied or, or uh, abused on uh, as a result of what you've been writing? Um, what, how did that... Yeah. You know, how did you react to that? I mean, uh, people, you know, when you put yourself out there like that and you can have, you know, uh, 500 lovely comments and there'll be one nasty one and that's the one that sticks with you for the rest of the day. Um, and the next time you make a video, that's the one you think about. For sure. Um... That's something that I has almost become normal to ex to expect that, um, which is not you know that's that's not okay. But um, I think it's that playground scenario of you can have loads of kids playing and having fun, and they'll maybe one will make a spiteful comment. Mm. I think it's a it's unfortunately it's a human thing, and we can't really silence people mm. and censor people from that kind of thing. I think there are there are certain buzzwords that people say you know you spoke about people saying you know to, to kill yourself and things like that and I think it's it becomes a really tricky um, line to toe in terms of 
of course, if we could stop people from saying that, it would be the best case scenario. But also, in terms of censoring people, mm. it's kind of, I think it's tricky. Um, yeah, I think being aware that people can be nasty and horrible on the internet is, is so important. Um, and and that's, that's just one-off comments. I mean, mm. is there anything that's ever gone beyond that? that, that uh, there will, there will be people who reply to everything I do with something spiteful and horrible right. um, and I can just see on, for example on an Instagram message that they've replied to everything I've ever posted with a horrible comment right. but in a way and it's so awful that I'm desensitised to it but I find it hilarious reading like what they come up with because you get to the point where you've heard it all <laughs> yeah. and unfortunately yeah. um, and I know that, and I know deep down that that should not be a normal thing um, <gasps> but I'll show my flatmates and be like can you like, look at this yeah. comment, how ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I think the more harmful ones are the, are the ones that actually pick apart things that I do yeah. um, and my like, relationships with people because it, it suddenly makes you kind of really start questioning everything and, and, yeah. and my, yourself as a person. My reaction to it is, is that well, this, the one that's going to kill me is not going to tell me he's coming. Yeah, uh, but, very true. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, but... but what would you say? Um, it, it, would you say that there is a widespread problem with with, with, with this on, the, on on social media? And you, you, do you think it's something that needs tackling? And if so, how would you go about it? Um, I think what that targeted abuse of people should be should be um, a, a police matter. And sure. Do you think enough's being done around you know those individuals? I that I problem? wouldn't know what the consequence was if I were to troll someone right now. I don't know what the consequence of that would be in terms of whether that would whether you'd have to go to court and, and whether there'd be a fine or whether you'd be you know blocked from social media and how that would work I think that um, I've, I've seen in the news a lot about um, Katie Price's son Harvey who's obviously subjected to a lot of so, of online abuse it's, it, you can see it everywhere on social media and it's horrendous it's awful it's vile um, and I think that there should be things in place where we can report it and it would actually because um, if people are kind of doing targeted abuse, you can report it to, say, Twitter, who can then block the person from accessing Twitter. But there's no actual consequence in the real world. There's no, you know, okay, so now you can't use that app, but you could probably make another account. There are ways around it, but there's no um, consequence that, that you could face or kind of... You, I, don't, I can't imagine being reprimanded in the real world for doing something like that or seeing someone <laughs> seeing it happen to someone mm. um, and I think if there were those deterrents then people would really rein it in because I can't if if you've threatened someone with I can report this to the police you know then I think that it would instantly stop this person who messages who replies to everything I do with a horrible comment mm. if I just said I've reported you you know I think that they would probably if they knew what the exact consequence was in the real world then I think they would take it a lot more seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And, and did it ever spill over in gaming into anything more? Did, are you aware of anyone suffering any intimidation or, you know, sort of harassment as a consequence of failing in a game? Or, um, yeah. I mean, personally, not necessarily, but there's so much of it that goes on in gaming, all the way up to swatting. Don't no, even know what swatting no, is. No. It's where you find, um, say you're playing with someone, you spend ages finding their actual house address online and then you call in a bomb threat or a kidnapping or a hostage situation and they get the armed police into the house to arrest this person that they think has done this when in reality there's nothing wrong. And people have been killed as a result of this, especially in America where they, um, they've been shot um, as soon as the police have come in. And it's... It's, it is. It does have its serious repercussions, but the fact is that people can actually do this just because you called someone a name online, and that's that's pretty much the worst that you can get online swatting. But there's everything from uh, doxing um, to just getting their personal details to harassing them online through messages, and there's just no repercussions for those. But I think if you called someone a name in the real world, you not much would happen, you might get punched. But it's it's not gonna, I don't know if it should have the same kind of punishment for, um, say, insulting someone online as it does in the real world. So it's because it happens so much and it's so regular that I think someone should be done online as opposed to in real worlds where it just doesn't really affect anything. 
if that makes sense. It yeah. <laughs> yeah, wasn't very clear. Sense. It does, yeah. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're back. Well, it was, you, you've opened up a whole new area, actually, of discussion. I was wondering whether you had any views about grooming online through gaming, because it was raised with me that the uh, NSPCC, they said that this goes on and that there are 5,000 online grooming offences recorded in the past 18 months. It's hard to know the exact extent of it. And this is happening through gaming, a lot of it. Uh, is, have you got any experience? Because obviously you are making live connections with other people uh, <coughs> who effectively could control you. Have you had any experience of that? No. Wait, so so what's, what's grooming again? It's... Uh, Sort of coercive behaviour by another person or an adult of a child or a man or a girl or anything really uh, and it's a clearly a growing issue that has been little talked about. Do, you, do you have any experience? It's something the, the, no. uh, the NSPCC, uh, it's definitely on their radar now. I have no idea. Um, the only thing I can think of is that you're playing these games and now you've suddenly got something in common with this person and you can talk to them and you feel more comfortable talking to them about this so you can talk about the game and because it's so easy to chat to these people it's probably not impossible to carry on there to take it further and there are some weird people that play games like there are some really weird people that <laughs> you just meet online and because you don't know how old they are exactly and they could no. pretend to be somebody entirely different couldn't they yeah you can even change your voice online you can download a software to change your voice and people pretend to be a girl or a, an old man or whatever it might be and it's really easy to do that so it, I think that could be another issue um, which I didn't even think of <laughs> it's, yeah, it's... that's great um, I think that concludes our questions this morning um, Thank you all for your candour and for coming and talking to us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.